friends good morning welcome to this episode of daybreak god's mercies are new every morning so let's praise god through this song who turns the day to night and watches me Begin to dream, Jesus, it is you. Who brings me food for my table? Who cares for all of my needs? Who walks the road with me, has grown? was a spiritually uplifting song certain messages and stories have a lots to teach us so let's hear to one such message good morning and for our reflection this morning i'd like to take a little passage from the gospel of john chapter 10 verses 11 and following 
Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the shepherds and the sheep. I know those who live in cities rarely get an opportunity to see the shepherd leading his flock to greener pastures. But people in the villages are very familiar with the image of the shepherd and the sheep. In fact, of all the images of God in the Bible, one of the most beautiful images of God is that of a shepherd. And in the passage that I read for you, Jesus talks of himself as the good shepherd. He's not just a good shepherd who watches his flock, who takes care of his flock, but he's also the good shepherd who's willing to lay down his life for a sheep. There's a beautiful relationship that happens between the shepherd and the sheep. There are three important qualities of a sheep and in its relationship with the shepherd. First of all, the sheep knows the shepherd. Secondly, the sheep listens to the shepherd. And thirdly, the sheep follows the shepherd. And those three are the important qualities of a disciple. A disciple is one who knows the master. A disciple is one who listens to the master. A disciple is one who follows the master. And the sheep does it to perfection. The sheep knows the master from a distance because it listens attentively to the voice of the shepherd. No other shepherds could come and take away another man's sheep because there is a bond that happens. There's a relationship that happens between the sheep and the shepherd. That's how the sheep knows the shepherd and the shepherd knows the sheep. So much so the shepherd would name each and every one of his sheep brown leg a black ear, different names. Because the shepherd knows the sheep and the sheep knows the shepherd. The second most beautiful quality of the sheep is that the sheep listens to the voice of the shepherd. A disciple is someone who listens to the voice of the master. We live in a world, my dear friends, there are so much of noises all around us. There's so much of noises that we seldom hear the voice of our master. The voice of God who speaks to us every day. No matter how much of noise, in the midst of all that noise, the sheep can identify the voice of the shepherd. Can we, in all the hustle and bustle of life, in all the noises that we have around us, do we really listen to the voice of God? Do we really pay attention to the voice of God? God speaks to us every day, every moment, through different events and circumstances. If you're only close to God, if you're only close to the Master, can you only hear the voice of God? Only then, my dear friends, can you be attuned to the voice of God. He speaks to us through the pages of the Bible. Every time you sit down to pray, God speaks to you in the silence of your heart. Can we become like the sheep today? Not only to know the shepherd, but also to listen to him every day. And only then, my dear friends, it becomes easy to follow the shepherd. It becomes easy to follow our master and Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want you to spend some time today reflecting on these three aspects of the sheep and the shepherd. Reflecting on these three important aspects between the master and the disciple. And for us as baptized Christians in our relationship with our Lord Jesus, who is not only the good shepherd, who is not only our master, but he's our Lord and Savior. Let us know him. Let us spend time getting to know him. Let us spend time listening to him. And let us spend time following him every day of our life. Amen. I'm sure this message was an enriching one. All saints were just people like us, but the only difference was they had trust in God. So let us hear to one such story of a saint. St. Cajetan was a zealous reformer of the clergy, founder of the Theatine Order and patron saint of the unemployed. Throughout his life, St. Cajetan demonstrated concern and care for those less fortunate than himself, speaking out against exploitation of workers, poor wages, and unhealthy working conditions. Such zeal did he show for the salvation of his fellow men that he was surnamed the Huntsman for Souls. Deeply devoted to our Blessed Mother, St. Cajetan was graced by visions of Mary even at the hour of his death. Born in Vincentia, Italy in 1480, of pious and noble parents, Cajetan was dedicated to the Blessed Virgin at birth. From childhood he was obedient, temperate, and charitable. A distinguished student, he served as a model for his peers in academic achievement and morality, achieving a law degree in Padua. Even as a university student, however, his great desire was to enter the priesthood, although his diary entries suggest he did not consider himself worthy. Following his graduation as an attorney, he left that city to seek out humble obscurity in Rome. However, once arriving, he was invited by Pope Julius II to accept the position of apostolic lawyer, a high office. Reluctantly, Cajetan accepted the offer, Pope Julius II saw to Cajetan's ordination in 1516 when he was 36, after which he offered many fervent masses. Subsequently, he joined the confraternity of divine love, leaving the papal court to work with the poor. Working with his fellow members, Cajetan was known to be very prayerful and introduced the concept of frequent communion. He was reported to spend at least eight hours each day in solitary prayer. On Christmas Eve at the Church of St. Mary Major, he was given the gift of his first vision of our Blessed Mother. On the death of Pope Julius II, as well as the death of his mother, Cajetan returned to Vincentia. There he sought out the poorest and sick, founding a hospital of the incurables when he was 42 years old. He joined the Confraternity of Divine Love with that of the Confraternity of St. Jerome whose members were drawn from the lowest classes. His noble family was appalled by his association with the lower class, but Cajetan paid them no heed, spending his fortune in building hospitals and nursing the plague-stricken. Out of obedience to his spiritual director, St. Cajetan traveled to Venice, enacting immediate reform in the lives of the clergy there. The greatest need of the time was the reformation of a church that was sick in head and members. He realized that to reform the church, an obedient and zealous clergy was required. Along with the Bishop of Theata in the Kingdom of Naples and two other fervent Christians, he instituted the first community of regular clerks, known as Theatines. They devoted themselves to preaching, the administration of the sacraments, and the careful performance of the church's rites and ceremonies. Members of the order lived apostolic lives, looking with disdain upon all earthly belongings, receiving no income and accepting no salaries from the faithful. The Theatines were outstanding among the Catholic reform movements that took shape before the Protestant Reformation. The patron saint of the unemployed, St. Cajetan further demonstrated considerable care for the livelihood of his parishioners. Not only did he work for wage reform, 
He founded a bank to help the poor and offer an alternative to usurers. This bank later became the Bank of Naples. Cajetan is also known as the patron saint of gamblers, as he is remembered for a gentle game he played with parishioners. He would bet prayers, rosaries, or devotional candles on whether he would perform some service for them. Of course, he always performed the service, and the parishioners always had to pay by saying the prayers they had bet against him. Having returned to Rome, Cajetan was captured and scourged by the invading Germans who were hoping to discover where he had hidden his riches. Of course, St. Cajetan had long spent everything he had in service to the poor and struggling. Once let out of prison, he never recovered from the vicious torture. Having returned home, his doctors tried to get him to rest on a softer bed than the boards he slept on. But Cajetan answered, My Savior died on a cross. Let me die on wood at least. It was then, when St. Cajetan was on his deathbed, that he again beheld the Blessed Virgin, surrounded by ministering seraphim. In profound veneration, he said, Lady, bless me. Mary replied, Cajetan, receive the blessing of my son, and know that I am here as a reward for the sincerity of your love and to lead you to paradise. Then turning her countenance, full of majesty and sweetness upon him, she said, Cajetan, my son calls thee. Let us go in peace. St. Cajetan died peacefully, surrounded by the choirs of heaven. His relics are interred in the church of San Paolo Maggiore in Naples, outside of which is a statue of him. In 1671, Cajetan was canonized and his feast day is celebrated on August 7th. Let us pray. St. Cajetan, you studied to be a lawyer, but when you felt that the Lord was calling you to his service, you abandoned everything and became a priest. You excelled in virtues, shunning all material rewards for your labor, helping the many unemployed people of your time. Look on us with mercy and help us also to spend our resources and lives in such humble service to the Church and all people. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us remember in our prayers the unemployed, O oh Lord God, look with pity on the millions of people in our country who wake up each morning without certainty of finding food because they don't have work. These people become victims of desperation and some even resort to crimes to survive. Help our government leaders formulate policies that will bring about employment. This we ask through the intercession of St. Kedgetin. Amen. Let's follow the footsteps of the saint and learn to depend on the word of God to strengthen ourselves. Let's listen to the promise verse of today. First let me read the passage, then we shall reflect on it. Then he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was many furlongs distant from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, men of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dear friends, today we are presented with a miracle or a double miracle expressing the divinity of Jesus 
and demand, you know, presenting the need of faith. This episode is related to the multiplication of the loaves. In the gospel according to John, immediately after the multiplication of the loaves, the people wanted to make him Jesus king. And knowing that they were coming to take him by force and make him king, Jesus sent the disciples out into the, in the sea or the lake, and he himself went onto the mountain. Matthew says he himself went to pray. Now the situation is Jesus is on the mountain praying, and the disciples are in the sea fighting a storm. And they were about to sink. A very symbolic picture, a boat without Jesus in it, a boat that is being threatened by storm, threatened to sink. And so this is the situation where they cry out and then Jesus comes, it's about the three o'clock in, in the morning, so it's a long time. They had been struggling and then Jesus comes, they think this is a ghost. So first of all, the boat is without Jesus. The second, when Jesus appears, they misunderstand him for a ghost. And when they realize that it is Jesus, Peter makes the request, Lord, let me come. And Jesus invites him to come. And on the way, he is sinking in the sea. A boat that is somehow caught up in a storm, and the head of the boat, Peter, sinking in the sea. A very drastic, terrific picture. And I think a picture that is very, very similar, applicable to us today in the church. The church being rocked by so many storms, scandals, accusations. Sometimes true, sometimes not, not true. Anyhow, the, church, the board that is the church is being rocked everywhere in the West and the East, also in our so all traditional faithful Catholic Church of Kerala also. So this is the situation. So the church... The board represents the church. Now coming back to the board, and Jesus knew that they were struggling. And Jesus knew that he was going to save them. And when Jesus comes, the people do not recognize. They were so much taken up by their own pain and panic, they could not even recognize Jesus, their master. Then he comes, calls out, it is I, I am, ego, eimi. That is the revelation God made to Moses. Moses on the Mount Sinai, before the, in front of the burning bush, asked, you, I, I shall go and tell my people the God of our fathers has sent me. Then when they ask, what is his name? What is your name? Shall I say? What shall I say? I am who I am. I am. So this is the absolute declaration of God's name. I am. That I am is being used here. Jesus says, I am. Not only that you are familiar, Jesus, I am has much more deeper implication. The ego, Amy, saying they call it, I am. So then Peter wants to walk. And as long as he was looking at Jesus, as long as his attention was focused on Jesus, he could walk on the sea, on the waves. Nothing could hurt him. But the moment he took his eyes away from, the, from Jesus and looked around, he was so much taken up by the, the storm and the wind and the waves and he was sinking. A Peter sinking in the sea because Peter lost sight of Jesus. And I think this is a great lesson we have to keep in mind for everybody from starting the Peter to the least of the people. Anybody has to be focused on Jesus. And then Jesus gets to the boat and the storm stops and everybody declare, believe, they are afraid, they are scared. But at the same time, you are the son of God. Really, you are the son of God. And I think this is a great lesson for us. It can be in your daily life, personal life, family life. Your life is the boat. Without Jesus sinking in the storms and beware that Jesus is with us. Don't be afraid. Jesus sees, Jesus watches. So we should be aware that we are on a mission sent out by Jesus. It is Jesus who had sent them out in the boat on the other side. So if he has sent me out on a mission, he will be with me to help me to reach the place where he has sent, to accomplish the mission he has entrusted to me. We have to believe that. And then Peter thinking, why? Because Peter lost sight of Jesus. So the focus should be on Jesus. 
not on our own troubles. The troubles can be great. Troubles can be so of ourselves impossible to solve as the church is in today's present. Loss of faith, breaking of families, and accusations from all sides, loss of people from the church, scandals, and all this somehow rocking the boat, the church, but at the same time, remember that Jesus is in the boat, and he will save us. The boat belongs to Jesus. So we have only to pray and believe. These are men of little faith. Why did you doubt? Where is your faith? Faith means not only believing, accepting a system of doctrines, but faith means commitment to the, in the hands of God. My life is anchored in Jesus. That is faith. He will hold on to me. And I, even if I can't, he will keep me. So life is committed to Jesus. His commitment is come something like leap into the dark, giving myself entirely, my family, my church into the hands of God and trust he will hold on and he will keep. The storms will pass, there will be peace and the church will be again thriving. Let us ask the prayer for this grace. Heavenly Father, as in the time of Jesus and the disciples, the boat was rocked in the Sea of Galilee, so also today the boat, the church, is being robbed with so many problems, accusations, and scandals. Father, send us your spirit. Strengthen our faith. Make us aware that you are the guide. Jesus, you are the master. You are in the boat, and you will never allow this boat, the church, to sink. We ask for this grace through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we are reaching to the end of this episode, let us thank God for filling us with His Word and praise Him through this song. Altogether lovely, altogether worthy, 
all together wonderful to me. I wish you all a day full of joy, peace and divine blessings. <laughs>